chapter 1, Romans, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Romans, chapter 1. Well, skip over Acts, you'll get to Romans. My goodness. Man, I'm tired looking at that video. And in the middle of all that, there would be a whole lot of stuff going on. <clears throat> Maybe that's my, my, my voice is about gone. Uh, when I got born again, November the 10th, 1979, as you realize, that's a long time ago for a lot of you weren't even born then. So for 40 years, I've been serving God. And, and serving Him, I understood what it was. It's okay to be a believer and learning and growing toward being a Christian. But one of the things that I think we've missed at is that when Jesus died on the cross, He died for the church. Now, when I say church, that is a... Um, a gathering of people. Now, I know he died for us individually, but he had a love for the church. That's the thing that, that affected him, that um, gathering of folk, if you would. That's why we have so many churches. So when you read the Word of God, you realize that. You pick it up in the book of Acts when Paul started churches and uh, gatherings. So I want to talk to you this morning, kind of a preaching, not so much preaching, not so much teaching, but a little bit of, uh, Pastor Richard, would you come on up here a little closer to me? I just, oh, never mind. How dare I? You stay back there if you want to. You know, I, I, one day I'll be retired and somebody will be trying to pull me to the front. And I'm going to say, leave me alone. But I'm honored to have my friend Pastor Richard here. Y'all give him a hand. Yeah. <laughs> what you don't know about this man, not only is he an, an Onesimus that I preached last week and Tuesday and Wednesday night that went and sought out Paul and, and comforted Paul. Pastor Richard's been that man in my life that's helped me so many times and come along beside me when probably I was in trouble and lifted me up and encouraged me when I wanted to quit and things of that nature. So we've known each other for 30-something years now. And uh, now he's helping uh, Nathan Hyman, whose wife passed away, and no friend of mine. He's working with uh, other churches around the area. So, And then uh, Sun Harvest, the church you started, their youth are going to be going with our youth to camp. So that, that's a good little mix taking place there. Are you comfortable? Good. Romans 1. I got to get you up because some, some of you stayed up late like HD and Ben and others. You know, y'all been out uh, working at the camp all week. So you, you got to keep you awake. Maybe you just leave y'all standing through the service. Y'all just stand with me through the whole service. How about that? I get to stand, so I do. You just fall over. Paul said in Romans 1.14, I am obligated both to Greeks and non-Greeks. Again, my thought today is learning to be the church. How, you know, you, somebody got to teach you how to be the church. How we, and when I look at the little country church, I see a group of people that have learned to be the church. There's so many things that we do right, and you don't even realize you're doing it right. Amen. Leon, Victoria, good to have you guys back again. That's twice now. One more time, you members, okay? That's all it takes. I'm obligated both to the Greeks and the non-Greeks, both to the wise and to the foolish. Wow. Paul said, I'm obligated to the wise and the not so wise. Amen. Obligated to. That is why I am so eager to preach the gospel also to you who are at Rome. I am not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes, first for the Jew and then for the Gentile. Now, you got to go back into Paul's culture and understand there was such a a prejudice about the Jews and the Gentiles. The Jews couldn't stand the Gentiles, the Samaritans, and all of those. And then in, within the Jews, there was the Herodians, the Sadducees, and, and the um, what, what, um, Pharisees in that group, and they were almost prejudiced against the common Jew. Amen. So they just ran all rampant. So Paul said, let me tell you my ams. I am. I am obligated first to all people. And when I think about the gospel, I am obligated to all people and wherever they're at. Amen. That's what he's saying here. And then he goes on to say, uh, to the wise and the unwise, to the Greek and the non-Greek. I'm also, and I love that thought, I am obligated. Listen, sometimes we act like, you know, I'm just going to let them people be. I'm not going to worry about them people. I, missions is important to me. To reach into places, you know, we have a daughter that's in Thailand right now. She'll be back soon. But Missions is so important. We support people in Mexico and, and uh, I'm trying to think of other places that we go to. But uh, Pine Ridge here in America we support. So there's a lot of places that our missions goes out and takes care of. 
which is important. And we're going to do it again next year. I can see a whole new group of guys heading back south again, Jerome, amen, to build homes. So I am eager also to preach the gospel, he said. There's that eagerness inside of us to share good news. In verse 16, he said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. Now, here's our problem, learning to be the church and understanding the church world. 73% of American churches are 100 people or less which means this morning we are above average. 60% of those are below 60 members. And when I travel, I see little churches everywhere. And I love little churches, man. I love preaching little churches, but I want to help little churches grow. That's my passion. I want to help them understand this thing and get going, man, and, and pick up. When you understand this, we need to move past maintenance and into taking mountains. We need to just say, quit babying and coddling everybody and say, listen, guys, it's time we grow up and go reach. So this morning I want to talk to you about first we gather. We gather for one reason, then we scatter. Everybody say scatter. Man, when you guys leave here, you're like a bunch of ants heading to your own molehill. I mean, you're just scatter out everywhere. But in scattering, you've got to take what you gathered here. And take that and take it out somewhere. Father, I thank you for your word. Help my voice to carry through the next two services. I thank you for the folk here, the guests that showed up. Thank you for our kids. Let it be a residue for over the weekend that it just maintains, holds on to them. Let them affect their parents. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. See, the issue, he said, the, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. It's the power of God for the salvation of everyone who believes. And all of us have to share the gospel with everybody we know. Family, friends, people we connect with, all people, he said here. But there are hindrances to sharing the gospel. There are roadblocks that pop up. One of the first hindrances I have found, particularly in the American church, is we're too busy with the temporals instead of the eternal. We all about what's going on in our life, in our circle, in our sphere of influence, but we forget there's eternity out there. And eventually, I, I told the kids, I was very sober with our, our kids. I told them one day, Pastor Paul Paul will not be here, that I will leave here and go into eternity. Amen. We're not here to stay. We're not here. I know some of you, you've, you've, you've got three or four uh, uh, storage buildings you saving up what your grandpa gave you and your mama gave you. And you think one day you're going to leave here in a hearse pulling the U-Haul trailer and it ain't going to happen. Amen. Whatever you got is going to be dispersed a whole bunch. Of, and probably, folk, you don't even like. Can I get an amen? amen. Psalm 39, 4 says, show me, O Lord, my life's end and the number of my days. That's why you hear me say all the time, God, give me a heads up. Let me give me a little idea about when I'm going to exit this place. Show me, O Lord, my life's end. And the number of my days, let me know how fleeting my life is. You got, in, most of us, we've all been through the death and, of somebody we've loved and cared about. But you need to also understand they left the land of the dying and they went to the land of the living. And they'll never die again. And everybody Jesus raised from the dead died. Do you ever think of that? I mean, they had to go through it twice. Lazarus, I, I don't even tell us about the end of his life, but I was always wondering, how, Lazarus, how he died twice. Where he was at, how old he was, what was going on. Was his nagging sister Martha still around? So my question, I made my statement to you, is think eternal. Our lives are but a vapor. Think eternal. Understand this. I, I see pictures back in the, when we started the church 20 years ago. This was not white. You did this. <laughs> is that right, David? They did this to us. Amen. And that's what happens because life keeps moving on. Matthew 6, 10, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So the scripture talks about heaven, something about heaven. See, here's our problem. We are too earthly minded to be any heavenly good. Did I say that right? Yeah, I did. We're too earthly minded to be any heavenly good. We don't think about what's going to take place next when we exit this place and how many people we're going to bring with us and all the things that we cast ahead. We moved our treasures ahead. There are three things that went on in heaven. I see them all the time. First thing that went on in heaven to kick the devil out. So thy will be done on. Come on, say it. Thy will be done on as it is in. So what they do in heaven? Kick the devil out. You got to get the devil out, man. They're, they're, when I look through life, it ain't about color. It ain't about culture. It's good, evil, light, darkness. That's all I see. It's the condition of the hearts of the people that I'm around. So your heart, that means everything to me. So when I look at this, they kicked the devil out. They removed him. Jesus said he saw Satan fall as lightning from the sky. The second thing that's going on in heaven, they're building the kingdom. 
Jesus said, I'll go away and prepare a place for you. I'm building a place for you that where I am, you may be also. If it were not so, I would have told you. Trust in God, trust also in me. So they're building up in heaven. So every time somebody gets born again, somebody gives their life to Christ, God builds an extra room on the hacienda. That's a big thing to me. So if they build in there, let's keep building here. Can I get an amen? amen. We want to leave structures here that when we pass away, there are kids and kids' kids that come up and say, my papa worshipped here. My grandma worshipped here. We still build in the kingdom, still expanding, not just in buildings, but in reaching people's lives. And the other thing that you're going to find out in heaven is they worship. Oh, I know some of you down here, you don't understand. This is practice. And when you get to heaven, if you ain't been practicing, when I played football, I had to practice. I had to know what the plays were. I had to know what was going on. Can you imagine some folk getting to heaven who accepted Jesus as their Lord and Savior and never learned to worship? And they get around a King David who's dancing and playing a musical instrument, amen, and get around Aaron who's shouting the praises of God, and we're down here, we're looking around like, like an old mule staring at a new gate. Listen, it's okay to express yourself. I know some of you think, well, I'm, I'm embarrassed. Well, I will be embarrassed together. Express yourself. Worship is an outward expression of an inward love. When you love something, you're going to express yourself. Let me tell you something. I got, I, I, I've been riding Harleys for a long time, and I, I'm, I polish that bike up. I don't worship that bike, but I worship when I'm on that bike. I watch that hot rod of mine. I get out in. I don't worship that hot rod. But then when that rubber is burning and I go to second gear and hit it, feel that back end tuck, oh, Jesus. So you got to learn to express yourself. So this is what, what he means by thinking eternal. I got to think eternal. I got to realize when I get to heaven, I got to worship. Amen. I know some of you, you're warming up into it. You're kind of half mass. <laughs> some of you, you just got one hand up. You're testing the water. You're afraid if you get your hands too high, God's going to shock you. Amen. I pray he does. See, here, here's our thing. Let me say it again. Too busy with the temporals instead of the eternal. Our problem has always been that the thought, no margin for error, that there's margins in life. There's margins. This book barely has any margins here on the sides. I like something I can write in. But, but I, I've taught on this thought before, but I want you to hear me. A margin is the amount available beyond what is necessary. You get 24 hours in a day. If you get eight hours sleep, that leaves you 16 hours. Out of that 16 hours, if you work uh, eight hours, that leaves you what? another eight hours. So you have a margin left over to be with family or kids or other things of that nature. Amen. You've got to give yourself some time. One of the things about us is we're too busy. And I hear people say the word all the time, and you know it's one of my triggers. You say busy around me? I got a couple of triggers. Busy is one of them. I've been pastoring 20 years in Little Country Church, and I changed my ways after I started pastoring at Pastor Richard because I was busy when I at my former church. So I quit being busy. People call me and say, you must be busy. You got, you're pastoring two churches. You're, you're part of running that youth camp. You're doing this, that, and the other. And I will tell you every time, I have not been busy in years. I refuse to be busy. Busy, 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 busy. I meet people that tell me, I call them up and say, man, I've been trying to reach you. Where you been? Well, I've been busy. I have never been too busy to answer a phone call. I've never been too busy to return a text. I've never been too busy not to reach out and touch somebody I love. Amen. So don't give me that. What you're being is lazy. You ain't busy, you lazy. Amen. You're not, you're not, you know, it doesn't affect you enough. You're not thinking eternity enough. You don't realize how much it affects people's lives. If these guys get one hold of me, they get hold of me. You need hold of me, uh, you'll get hold of me. That's just the way I am. I know I'm setting myself up. Amen. I mean, I can't cover everything, but I can find other people that can. Amen to look after. So, so when you think about it, this margin, look at this. Financial margin. How many of us mess up in this area? Do you know you need some money left over? If you ain't got no money left over, you're going, you're going to go into the panic mode. Money left over at the end of the month. Let, let me say this to you about financial. If your if if upkeep is greater than, let me see, I don't think I wrote it down. It's smarter when I write it down, Jerry. Yes, it is. 
I, I know. There, there it is. There it is. If your outflow is greater than your inflow, then your up keeps your downfall. If you ain't got something left over, amen, you're in trouble. Make sure that I'm going to say it to you one more time. If your outflow is greater than your inflow, your up keeps your downfall. So in life, they're going to try to give you credit cards. They're going to try to press on you. And the margin, amen, you run out of margin because now you panic and you start charging everything on the charge card. Now they got you. And once they, say, once they got you, they're going to start squeezing you. And then they're going to add interest on it. And next thing you know, you're never going to pay that house off, that car off, that, that new bed off, that, 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 that luxury recliner that you had to have that massages you. Amen. And you had to have that. Hallelujah. And the next thing you know, you And then there's ministry margin. Everybody here, everybody say, every member, a minister. Everybody in here is ministers under God. Everybody here. And when it comes to ministry, you've got to have time to help without feeling overwhelmed. So in my life, I make sure I give myself some time in order to help people. Because if I don't, you'll feel overwhelmed. To be, the issue here is to be more involved with the work of the Lord. Here's our problem than the Lord of the work. I want to make sure i got time for God. i got to have time to talk with Him, relax with Him. And I do that often in my vehicle, on my bike, or wherever I'm at. I make sure i got some time. And that somebody says, uh, Pastor, you sure like mowing grass? I do, because that's my time. Amen. I think of my messages, my sermons. I think of you. I will stop on a mower and text somebody I ain't talked to in years. Amen. Last week, I texted somebody that I hurt their feelings years ago, and I didn't know I'd done it. And the Holy Ghost tapped me on the shoulder while I'm mowing grass and said, Jerry, you were condescending and arrogant. And I said, who are you talking to? He said, you were condescending and arrogant. You were not nice to that preacher. So I, I, I fought it, man. I fought it because who wants to admit you're arrogant? Brian, who wants to admit that? Who wants to admit they're, they're, they're condescending? Amen. No, nobody, Joseph. Nobody wants to do that. So, so I stopped the lawnmower and I, I fought with God. And then I text the guy, and I apologize, Bethany. And when I did, immediately the text came back, you don't know what that means to me. Let's get back together. See, the brother meant something to me. Because years ago, he went through a struggle, and I flew up there, and I took a gun away from him so he wouldn't end his life. We became friends, and he's pastoring again today. So I love when God puts his finger on you. And I, I, just, I don't have to always be that transparent with you, but I just want you to know I, I, I have my faults too. I'm human. And every now and then I got to back off and say, God, help me. Amen. Help me do the right thing here. You see, here's our problem. 75% of pastors go through a period of stress that is so great that they consider quitting the ministry. 35 to 40% actually do. 1,300 pastors resign every month. 1,300 said, I can't do this no more. Amen. In a decade, in 10 years, 40% of today's pastors will be in another line of work. 70% say they don't have no close friends. This is what happens. So you get to connect with, you get to have friends, but you don't get to have close friends. Because they get too close to you, then all of a sudden they, they, uh, they think they know you. And then they don't listen to you. They start acting like your kids. Let me keep going here. Let me keep going. I'm, I'm hitting some nerves. I feel it. So the greatest mistake is being busy and not effective. we got to be effective in the things we do. And I've always loved this passage, and I know you do too. In Luke chapter 10, verse 38, it says, Jesus and his disciples were on their way. He came to a village. There was a woman named Martha. She opened her house to him. She had a sister called Mary, sat at the Lord's feet, listening to what he's saying. But Martha was distracted. By all the preparations that had to be made. She's cooking for 13 people plus Lazarus to make 14. And then her sister, 15. Amen. And she's 16. She came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care? Don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. She didn't go to Peter and say, tell her to help me. Or Thomas, she went to Jesus. She went to the main one. Martha Come on, church. Martha, Martha. The Lord answered, you are worried and upset about many things. One translation said you're cumbered about it. You're, you're bothered by it. But one thing is needed. If Jesus said one thing is needed, guess what? One thing is needed. 
Just one thing is needed here. She's at his feet. She's worshiping him. But Mary was so, I mean, Martha was so busy. She's cooking. Amen. She's got the stove on, biscuits in the oven. Hallelujah. Little cake over here to spread on. Got a mixer over here. Amen. She got it all going on. And all of a sudden, all she hears is, oh, Jesus, that is so good. Oh, gee, I love you, Jesus, Jesus. Oh, come on, Jesus. Tell me more about it. You tell me Peter walked on the water and then he sank and then you picked him up and brought him back. Oh, gee, that's so good. She peeked out that kitchen, saw him in there, and Mary sitting at his feet. And all of a sudden, her face went to red. And she got upset. This, this Martha cracks me up because I know Martha's in the church. Martha can be a male or female. Amen. And she got upset because you're coming in here and worshiping. Amen. You love it on God. You see, it's, it has to do with timing. I don't believe that. I, I think Mary would help. I think she'd do. But at this moment, amen, Mar, uh, Mary got his attention. When I get Jesus' attention, I'm going to stay with him a little while. Amen. Martha thought Jesus wanted food. I love when Jesus said, I have food you know not of. Amen. I, I've, got, I've got it. You know, we are so earthly minded with no heavenly good. Amen. At that moment, she was touching heaven by being with Jesus. Martha comes out of the kitchen. Don't you care? Oh, don't hit my care button. Don't hit my care button. Don't tell me I don't care. You, you didn't visit. You didn't this. You didn't that. Don't hit my care button. You know I care. But I got a moment here with Mary. Don't you care that my sister left me to serve alone? Oh, there she is. She's so busy. And Jesus said, Martha, and I'll say it again. He said her name twice. He said that for a reason. If you don't calm the woman down, she's going to beat you to death with a rolling pin. Martha, Martha, thou art cumbered and troubled about much serving. But Mary has chosen the good part. It's not going to be taken away from her. Amen. That's a powerful statement. And if we'll learn that when we come in here, we ain't got to go cooking. We ain't got to do anything else but give our time to him. Just sit under his knee, amen, and listen to him and talk to him. Martha was busy, distracted by preparations. Mary was effective with her worship. And if you keep studying this, the life of Mary and Martha, you're going to see it over and over again. Amen. How Mary affected the heart of Jesus. You know, some believe busy like Martha is normal. We all got to be on the edge of a stroke. We all got to be burning up a little bit too much. We all got to be, every time somebody calls, say, well, I'll get back with you. Amen. We always think that. you got the most important thing on this earth is you. It's people. It's people. Loving people. Caring about people. So when your margin decreases, your stress increases. I will warn every leader in this house, be careful here. Amen. Your stress will increase. It's just going to keep on going. When the margin decreases, your relational intimacy decreases. You don't have time for spouse. You don't have time for kids. You don't have, because, because you run out of margin. Amen. You're too busy. Busy. What's busy? Being under Satan's yoke. Busy. Yeah, what busy he is. It's always out trying to do stuff, you know, texting, emails, phone, TV. You, you know, uh, the devil's strategy is to keep you busy with the minutia, the little things. You, you got to learn how not to major on the minors. Amen. Find out what's really important. When, there are times in my life, you know, you know, I did say I'll do whatever I can to reach for, but that, here's the other thing. I look at what is minor and what's major. If something's major, I'm going to go deal with it. But if something's minor, let's say this minor thing keeps happening. Let's call it a person. And this person keeps going through the same thing over and over and over and over and over. It's a cry wolf thing. After a while, you'll get tired of dealing with that. But if it's major and you know this person and they never cried for wolf and they need help, guess what? Go to the major. Can I get an amen? Let me keep moving here. When, when your margin decreases, your personal ministry effectiveness diminishes. You miss divine appointments. We need the margin for divine appointments, the extra space. A couple of years ago, I took off to Colorado. I had Richard Golightly with me, and I walked into a, uh, a, a 
a Western store, and I was talking with a young lady, and, and as I was talking with her, I got talking to her about God, and she said to me, I, I'm mad at God. I said, why are you mad at God? Her name was Marie. I said, Marie, why are you mad at God? She said, because my, my husband has a disease. He has a muscular dystrophy. And I said, well, come on. She said, he, and now my son has it. I said, what's it called? She said, charcoal Marie tooth. And for the first time in my life, I met somebody who had the same disease I got. And I looked at her, and I said, ma'am, you see me limp? You see me walk? You see, I've had, I've had construction on my, my, on my ankle. My fingers are twisting. Hey, Amen. I run out of, out of wind at times. I got the same thing your husband got. And she says, no way. And I said, Marie, can I pray with you? She said, yeah. I said, I want to ask you, do you want to know Jesus? She said, no. I said, would you like to? She said, yeah. If I didn't have the time to pray with her and pray for her husband and have the time to go meet people, I, I would miss out. But when I get to heaven, I will see her. You hear what I'm saying? you, you got to give yourself some marginal time. Now, I know I, I'm preaching to the people that are always doing stuff. Now, some of you may, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking about those who are watching right now. Uh, you're not doing anything but sitting there watching your phone all the time. you got to get out and start doing something. Can I get an amen? Amen. amen. We need this margin. To, to reach people that no one else is reaching, you got to do what other people are not doing. We must do what we do well, use it and develop many ministries. I know that's important, but let me tell you something. Many years ago, I started developing ministries, and it wore me out. So I'm very particular. First off, I'd never have a ministry if I ain't got a leader. There would be no sis if Bethany didn't want to be the leader. Amen. And there'd have to be one raised up that has the same heart for the girls. Same way with the youth, same way with the kids. You need leaders. Just because you got a need don't mean that you got to throw a, make a, a, a new ministry. <laughs> Amen. Hello. I got to move, man. I'm running out of time. Uh, we're religious but not spiritual. Oh, my God, I could spend some time on that one. When I got born again, I hung out with some religious people, and it, bothered, it started to bother me. I realized that people began to become more concerned with external than the internals. They were more concerned about what's going on, how you dressed, how you spoke, uh, how the things you did in worship. You know, you, don't, you can't run in a church. You, you can't lift your hands. You've you got to be quiet. You gotta be soft. And you got to learn how to talk, talk religious. Are you covered by the blood? Excuse me? Have you been washed in the blood? No, I did watch one show of Dexter. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? People get so, so religious. And, and I, I get around our folk, and y'all are so non-religious because you've been taught different. You understand this is about relationship. It's not about religion. Amen. We're not going to get caught up on all the externals. I've, I've seen pe preachers get mad because you weren't wearing a suit or you came in, you weren't wearing a dress and you weren't doing this and you weren't doing that. And I'm thinking, you, you're so caught up with it. I had a, and, and let me just back up. Just, it's about relationship. If you want to be filled with the Holy Ghost, ask God to fill you with the Holy Ghost. Amen. If you want to speak in other tongues, ask God to fill you with the Holy Ghost and speak in other tongues. If you want the gift of prophecy, ask God to give you the gift of prophecy. Quit waiting on somebody to walk up here and walk you through it. Just start seeking God. Amen. If you want a better job, ask God for a better job. Amen. Learn to have a relationship with Jesus to the point that anything in that book that you want, ask him for it. Just begin to ask him. It's not about formulas. Pastor, when you baptized, what did you baptize in? Did you baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost? Because Jesus said baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. I know he told the disciples to baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Guess what the disciples baptized in? Jesus. Man, they disobeyed Jesus. Because Jesus said baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And every time they baptize somebody, they baptize in the name of Jesus. Or then they baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus. They baptize in the name of Jesus Christ. Pastor, they messed up. No, they didn't. No, they didn't. It's a name above all names. Come on. Every knee going to bow to that name. Ain't no other name stronger, more powerful than Jesus. Ain't nothing upsets liberals more than the name of Jesus. On, you say Jesus on TV, they want to move the camera away. Amen. Can't stand in that. I love the name of Jesus. So when I baptize, I baptize in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And as the disciples carried forth the commandment, in the name of the Lord Jesus. I baptize in all of it. So either I'm all wrong or I'm all right. Can I get an amen? amen? Oh, my goodness. Thank you.
I got to keep going here. Fear of rejection. Fear of rejection can you cause us not to uh, carry forth the gospel. Uh, you, know, you know all about fear, guys. But we're so afraid someone's going to tell us no. Of course they will. I said no a bunch before I said yes. Amen. The scripture tells me to seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things be given. Amen. Fear results in the refusal to keep life in its proper perspective. When fear tries to overwhelm you, pause and ask yourself some questions. First, why am I afraid? I'm bigger than that spider. That lizard couldn't hurt me if it wanted to. I've hung bigger lizards than that on my ear. So ask yourself, why am I afraid? Whom am I afraid of? You're going to take this body? That's what was it. This was the spirit of Paul and Jesus and Peter. You're going to take this body? You take this body, I'll be in heaven. The worst you can do to me is send me to Jesus. Hear me. Again, we're so earthly minded, we're no heavenly good. Whom am I afraid? To whom have I been giving myself lately? Where are my priorities? So I got to walk here. I got hey, Let's walk, Cheryl. Got a lot to do. You know what? No, I don't. I'm going to stop right there. I'm going to stop right there, Dennis. We gather into this house for worship. Tell him we love him. Instruction. What are we going to do next? We're an orchestra in this house. I used to have a choir until I realized I was cheating the church. The church should be the choir. We should. When I'm sitting up here listening to y'all, I can hear them, Josiah. I can hear the choir singing. Amen. And, and, the, and what's great about the choir out here is those that are off note get drowned out by those that found the note. Love the choir. The church is a sanctuary for gathering. This is a safe place. You don't hear me use the word safe a lot because there's no safety in our species. But if there is one safe place, it's in God, and it's in the house. All through history, the word sanctuary meant a place you could run to that nobody could take you out of, that if I could get to the sanctuary, amen, I will be safe, that God's got me. If I can come to the sanctuary, amen, he'll take care of my problems. If I come to the sanctuary, he'll meet my needs. I need to be in the sanctuary. There was something about, oh, sis, you're going on through my sermon. Okay, well, that's good. Because I got to quit here. You heard me. Now, let's talk about scattering. Let's go to scatter. Why do we scatter? All right, Cheryl, now I'm waiting on you. There it is. Keep going. Keep going. An army overcoming spiritual opposition. The gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. Last night, me and Sister Lori went to see Sounds of Freedom. I wept. The exploitation of our children. There are more slaves right now in the world than there has ever been in the history of mankind. Slavery, taking children. We're rich, perverted. Again, there's only good and evil. There's light and darkness. It's a condition of the heart. I watched that movie, and the only thing I thought of, Pastor Richard, was Machine Gun Preacher. Amen. Because they went right together. It makes you want to take action. It makes you realize that you've got to watch out for your kids and other people's kids. Amen. The gates of hell are stationary. They don't move. Gates don't move. Church moves. Everybody say church moves. So we come in here, we get instruction, and we scatter out of here. Come on, go to the next slide. I'll move quickly. Amen. No weapon for them to keep on going. Hallelujah. There it is, Proverbs. He who is kind to the poor lives to the, uh, to the Lord. So when I go out of here, I've got to find folks that I can be a blessing to. Keep going. Next one. Amen. Scatter for service. The salt of the earth. You're the salt of the earth. Salt, salt heals. Salt soothes. Salt irritates. Somebody ever tell you, you irritate me. Thank you. I've been working on it for years. Amen. I want to irritate you. I want to bother you. I'm not the preacher. I'm not the pastor. I'm the pester. I will pester you. Amen. It irritates, and it makes one thirsty. Man, when you, you're the salt, you make people thirsty for what you got. Hallelujah. Everybody, come on, give me a little music by your head. Let me just go ahead and close this thing. 
I want you to scatter out of here. We'll, we'll, we'll complete this another time, Kenny. But it's so important that you understand. You came here for instruction today. You came here to find out that you're in the sanctuary. And you got to have some margins in your life. You've been playing this busy game way too long. God don't want you busy. He wants you effective. He wants you reaching the masses. He wants you, uh, and it doesn't mean, and sometimes the masses just mean one at a time. I was with a man, a missionary by the name of Brother Garrett. He was a missionary to the Philippines. He told me the story that one time he gave a young man who was hungry a sack of rice. He told the young man, take this sack of rice and go start a church. And the young man did. Just a sack of rice. Sometimes it don't take a lot to reach and to help people. Just a little bit. But I want you to scatter out of here. When you leave here, realize you're the salt of the earth. Don't let no devil demean you and tell you you're not. You're there to give life. Man, maybe you will irritate a little bit. But you also soothe and bring healing into people's lives. Father, I thank you for this house. I thank you for your people. I thank you for the Word of God that goes forth and changes our lives. I pray against the evil in this world that would exploit our children. But not only do I pray, God, I pray to somehow have the ability someday to be able to do something more about it. God, I thank you for your mercies. I thank you that our kids' camp, it was a sanctuary for them. It was a safe place for them. They were guarded and protected and loved. God, I ask you to bless the little country church. Make us more like you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Come on, give God praise. If you need a tither, offer an envelope. It's in front of you. If you want to hear this message completed, come to New Caney. I don't have a time restriction there. Amen. I can be able to hopefully finish it. And some of you may. How many have never been to the church in New Caney? Lift your hand. You never been out there? Oh, my goodness, guys. Come out there and join. I do them the same way. I tell them to come over here. I'll, I tell them every morning just about it. Y'all said hi. Whether you did or didn't, I just make sure that they know y'all like them. If you need to offer an envelope, it's in front of you. Our servant leaders are coming up. Yes, sir. Let's give God praise. The camera's doing better. I committed last week to our, our kids and to our youth $500 to each group to help them with whatever expenses anybody needs a sponsor. Amen. A lot of our kids, they, they, they need sponsors. They need a little help. So if you'd like to add a little extra today, you're sure welcome to. I've already told Pastor Joseph anything he needs. We want to bless them. And they, you know, I love our kids. And uh, I saw kids there this week that without your sponsorship would not have been there. They needed help. And uh, glad to see them blessed. And what's great is, is we didn't let them know. We just take care of them. Amen. Just come on in. So as we give today, we're believing God for? Remember, you can give on your phone. Sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts to models, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. Amen. Remember, guys, you can give on your phone, holywild.net slash give, and you can give on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And you just got to get to church to give now. Isn't that great, man? You can give all week long. You can get a giving spirit about you and give seven days a week. Mm -hmm. I'm talking to y'all out there in, in internet land too that's been watching us hallelujah S gather for instruction scatter for ministry you fix and enter the mission field and don't think America's not a mission field anymore we have become one of the did you know there are people coming from other countries to America to uh, evangelize that's how bad things got here we got to turn it around can I get an amen Pastor Joseph, come up and make a quick announcement about what you're going to do with the kids and get, turn it over to Pastor David, and I will go dry the sweat off. All right. Yeah.